Good morning. Welcome uh, to Living Waters this morning, whether you're joining us uh, in present in the building or whether you're joining us online. We're very thankful that you're here. Uh, if this is your first time worshiping with us, uh, we welcome you especially and we pray that, uh, that you would enter fully into our time together. Last week when we met together, uh, there were seven cases of diagnosed COVID-19 in Kingston. This morning, there are 27 cases. And uh, I don't say that to create fear. I, I say that to, to remind us of the context in which we're worshiping and the context in which we come together. And uh, medical professionals are not surprised by that. They said that they expected an increase in numbers in the second wave. But the reality is for, for us, this can create all kinds of mixed feelings, can it? Anxiety and fear and worry. And it's, it's not just fear and worry about potentially catching the virus and, and what that might mean for us or, or giving it to, to someone we know who might be more vulnerable. It's the thought of, well, what happens if things close down again? If we're, we're stuck at home, isolated again? And so there's so much uncertainty. But the great news is, is in the midst of all of this social uh, uncertainty and the, and the health uncertainty, uh, God is certain, right? God is certain. His goodness is certain. His faithfulness is certain. Uh, his love for us is certain. And when I think of the situation uh, we're living in, I'm reminded of, of one of my favorite passages uh, from the Old Testament. It's from the end of the book of Habakkuk. Now, some people say Habakkuk, and some people say Habakkuk. Put up your hand if you say Habakkuk. Put up your hand if you say Habakkuk. All right, the Habakkuks have it. Uh, but regardless of how you pronounce this, this prophet's name, I just want to read to you his final words, uh, because they speak, uh, they speak so strongly to us of the, the certainty that we can have in God. He says, uh, and you know these words, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. And at the risk of taking license with scripture, I suspect that if Habakkuk was here today, he would add to that, even though COVID numbers may rise. And even though we may be forced back into isolation, even though we have to quarantine ourselves, even though the future is uncertain and we don't even know what tomorrow will hold, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. And so friends, I pray that that is the posture and the attitude that we can take this morning. Again, whether we're here in the building or we're watching at home, that posture of joy uh, as we praise God for the certainty of who he is, for his goodness and his mercy and love. So I'm thankful that you're here with us this morning. I pray that, that you would encounter Jesus in our time together. Uh, and that you wouldn't leave this building or turn off your TV or your device the same way you turned it on, the same way you came in, that you would be changed by this experience. We begin this morning uh, by singing our opening song, Cornerstone. If you're here in the congregation, you can hum, you can speak the words, but we ask that you don't sing out. Please stand. We serve a God who's a heart God. He's an inside out God. So the worship that's required of us happens on the inside and flows out. God, we just thank you that our hope is in you. And we just declare that before the heavenly realms this morning, God. With our mouths, with our hearts, Trust you, Jesus.
If you're joining us online, you can find that liturgy under the resource section of our church website or posted just a post down from the one you're watching now. We begin with the acclamation. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. We call it for purity. Pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in continual godliness, that through your protection it may be free from all adversities and devoutly serve you in all good works, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated we listen to God's word. We're continuing our journey through Exodus, uh, with Exodus uh, chapter 34. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and do not let anyone be seen throughout all the mountain, and do not let flocks or herds graze in front of that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone, like the former ones, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. He said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. He said, I hereby make a covenant before all your people. I will perform marvels such as have not been performed 
in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you live shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. Good morning. It's nice to see a full house. <laughs> to see so many of you here in person. Let us pray. Lord, we long with Moses to know you. We want to encounter you here this morning. We want you to be present. We want to know you so that we can be like you. So take, take what you have here for us, put it deep in our hearts, deep in our bones. Mm -hmm. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive. And now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. Amen. So who is God? It's a question that haunts even those who deny the biblical God. Perhaps especially those who are most hostile to the biblical God. My uncle, who's visiting us here this weekend, gave me a good line, so I have to credit him. <laughs> he says, if we weren't so haunted by God, we wouldn't feel the need to kill him. And I want to point out that the rejection of the biblical God doesn't simply lead into secular paradise. And if you want to see how that plays out, just read a history of the 20th century. People don't cease to be religious simply because they no longer subscribe to the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition. In many ways, their religious impulses simply become confined to the horizons of this world in ways that are often stunningly oblivious to the debt that is owed to the biblical tradition that they reject or dismiss. This translation of religious hope into this worldly utopia often goes hand in hand with spiritualities that borrow from alternative cosmologies to that of the biblical tradition. But to return to my first point, the question of who God is doesn't go away. Constructions of alternative spiritualities happens alongside a reimagining of who God is. So many people are happy to believe in a generic, benevolent God who wants us to be happy, who wants us to be nice, who exists to do what he's asked to do or to serve and meet a need in a time of trouble. We're happy for God to be a divine pushover or a divine therapist and otherwise stay out of the way. As one theologian puts it, when things are going great, we don't bother him much. Thus, God doesn't play a role in our lives, and grace doesn't have a chance to transform us. Why change your life for such a God? He makes no demands. And alongside these culturally acceptable portraits of God is a portrait of the biblical God as at best suspect and at worst dangerous. The biblical God, especially as he is found in the Old Testament, is seen as arbitrary, unpredictable, untrustworthy, and even malicious. As the vitriolic critic of religion Richard Dawkins puts it in his book, The God Delusion, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And even if most people don't put it quite so aggressively, this is a widespread sentiment in our culture today. 
It's common to hear people casually condemn the God of the Bible in such terms and condemn people who would follow such a God as crazy, self-loathing, hate-filled bigots. As my wife puts it, people sure hate the Lord. <laughs> and as Jesus soberly reminds us, the servant is not greater than the master. Now, I'm not bringing this up to indulge in some sort of Christian victim complex. I reject that. On the contrary, I'm trying to illustrate just how great the stakes around the question of who God is really are. The character of God really matters. What is his character? How do we know it? What is God really like? Is he trustworthy? And rather than bringing our modern categories and prejudices to the biblical text, we have to have the humility to approach that text on its own terms. We must approach it in good faith, as we're encouraged to do with everything else, sensitive to its intentions. For as one biblical scholar puts it, one of the fundamental overarching convictions of our biblical authors is that God is utterly good. They, the biblical authors, are captivated by his love, astounded by his faithfulness, and amazed by his willingness and his ability to rescue them and ultimately the whole world from trouble. And I'd like to suggest this isn't a forced reading of the text. This actually emerges from a plain reading of the Old Testament itself. The story the Old Testament is telling is good news precisely because of the character of the God we encounter there. To put it bluntly, many contemporary readings of the Old Testament and many depictions of the God of the Bible are at best caricatures and at worst, simply dishonest. And as Christians, we don't get the option not to care about this. For the extraordinary claim that the New Testament is making is that Jesus is not only the one who brings Israel's story to its climax, he is Yahweh come among us. And who is Yahweh? Throughout Exodus and the biblical narrative so far, we have been seeing and hearing God do things. We've started to develop a picture of who God is and what he does. Yet, it's not the height of redemption from Egypt, but the nadir of the golden calf incident that leads to the awesome summary of God's character in Exodus 34, 6-7. A self-revelation that reverberates throughout Israel's story. This leads us into Exodus 34 and the points I'd like to make today. God's character is revealed in the midst of a relationship and in the flow of the biblical story. God is not cruel, arbitrary, or petty. He forgives, even as he punishes the guilty. And finally, along with the biblical authors, God's character is consistent and trustworthy. C.S. Lewis puts his thumb on the biblical perspective in the words of Mr. Beaver to, on Aslan to the children in the classic book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. The biblical God is not nice. The biblical God is not a capriciously malevolent bully either, but he is good. And it's the biblical God who's worth following, who actually has the power to transform our lives. So let's meet this God with Moses atop Mount Sinai. My first point. God's character is revealed in the midst of a relationship and in the flow of the biblical story. The self-revelation of God in Exodus 34 doesn't occur within a vacuum. It arises out of the golden calf incident, and it's actually a commentary on how Yahweh behaves in that story. It's not a neat little list of attributes that can be disconnected from that story. To paraphrase, paraphrase one prominent Jewish scholar, Biblical faith does not experience God as an idea. He's overwhelmingly real and shatteringly present. God wants to work out his intentions in the world through a covenant people. He wants to be known by his people. He even wants to dwell with his people. The problem is that these people fail right away. The first thing they do is jeopardize the relationship 
by egregiously violating the covenant they have just agreed to. As Moses is up on the mountain sealing the deal, the people are making a golden calf and celebrating it as Yahweh. And this is introducing a profound tension into the biblical narrative. What is God going to do with human partners he is committed to working through when they fail and betray him? This is a crucial moment. And the drama of it all is framed by Moses' five intercessions on behalf of the people, which are very consciously echoing his five attempts to get out of leading that people that he made back on that same mountain in Exodus 3 and 4. So intercession number one, don't destroy the people. As we heard several weeks ago, God's anger is aroused by the Israelites' honeymoon adul uh, adultery. He tells Moses to leave him alone so that he may destroy the people and start again with Moses. Yet in his command to Moses to leave me alone, which might be better translated, give me rest, Moses hears an invitation to intercede for the people. God doesn't have to announce his intentions or consult Moses, yet he listens to Moses' objections. It was Yahweh, says Moses, not me, who rescued the people out of Egypt. They were his people, redeemed by him, before they were ever invited to be his treasured possession, his kingdom of priests and his holy nation. Yahweh must think of how the nations will react to Israel's destruction. Egypt has come to know Yahweh too in the course of the Exodus. Will they now see him as inconsistent? having saved his people only to destroy them? Finally, will Yahweh abandon his promises to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promises he swore by himself to keep? His purposes and his integrity are on the line. But, as I was trying to illustrate a few weeks ago, Moses is not actually arguing against God here. He's participating in an argument within God himself. And he's paradoxically asking God to change course in the present in order precisely to be consistent with his character and his promises. And Yahweh relents. As we heard, he leaves space for grace and scope for hope. Moses knows that appealing to God in relation to his covenant, his name, and his promises can stay God's hand. Because those are the realities that are at God's heart. This is not to say that the threat of destruction is not real, or that Moses' intercession is not necessary. It is to say that God invites Moses into the pain and tension that the failure of his human partners bring him, even if his character and his promises require an act of grace on his part. Yahweh spares the people because he realizes that having a covenant people inevitably means dealing with their failures. As one Bible teacher puts it, God's purpose to work in the world through humans signs them up for these sorts of situations. This does not mean, however, in the context of this story, that the relationship is now in good standing, or that God is no longer just. Moses has brought God rest, but recognizes the need for ongoing intercession. And this leads to intercession too. Blot me from your book. So Moses returns to the camp to discover just what has been going on and how bad it really is. Now his anger is aroused too, and he smashes the stone tablets of the covenant. He destroys the golden calf and makes the people drink the powder. He acts to rein in the people who are running wild, rallying the Levites to him and tasking them with rooting out the worst offenders. Even the tragedy of this bloodshed, which pits brother against brother, is insufficient to cover for what has happened. Though Moses attributes this course of action to Yahweh, this is less divine punishment and more relationship preservation. For the idolatry and the immorality in the camp have to stop if there's going to be a possibility of a future. The idolatry of the golden calf and the ensuing immorality of the people represent a breaking of the covenant 
And this is symbolized in Moses' smashing of the tablets. A great sin has been committed, and Moses sees the need for atonement. In another remarkable scene, he offers his life on behalf of the people. Please forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Yahweh declines the offer. Moses' offer is either unnecessary or insufficient. Regardless, God retains the right to punish the guilty, striking the people with a plague. Though chapter 32 ends with his judgment, the rest of the narrative in 32 to 34 is marked by God's compassion. For chapter 33 reveals that the people have a future, even if the Lord is reluctant to go with them. So God spares his people and remains committed to them, despite their great sin. As Moses sees, it's a course of action that under the circumstances is not inevitable, but that it is already revealing something about the character of Yahweh. So intercession three, you have to go with us. As promised in Exodus 23, the Lord will send his angel with the people into the land he promised their ancestors. But he himself will not go with them. They are a stiff-necked people. The image here is of a stubborn donkey or ox, resistant to direction. And therefore Israel is well named. The characteristic difficulty of the people is a barrier to God accompanying the people. There is an incompatibility between God's holiness, we could also say his goodness, and their sinfulness. The people's proclivity rebellion for rebellion and unfaithfulness puts them at risk. God doesn't want a repeat of the golden calf incident. Maybe it's for the best if he doesn't come along. Moses again intercedes. Our attention is now drawn away from the rebelliousness of the people and towards the remarkable friendship of Yahweh and his servant Moses. The revelation of God's character thus emerges out of the soil, not just of his relationship with Israel, but out of the intimacy of his friendship with Moses. Again, it's hard not to see the importance of a righteous or rightly related mediator figure here. God knows Moses, and Moses has found favor with the Lord. And in spite of all his encounters and experiences so far, Moses longs to know God more. He wants to know God's way who God really is, and how he operates, so that he can not only continue to find favor with, the, with God, but convince him to, to accompany the people. As he says, remember that this nation is your people. The Lord says his presence, literally his face, will go with Moses. Moses pushes to have this favor extended to the whole nation. The plan falls apart, Lord, if you won't go with us. Your presence is the only thing that makes us different to all the other nations. And how will anyone know that I have found favor with you if you won't come with us? <laughs> the Lord agrees to do as Moses asks because he says, I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And Moses boldly takes it one step further. And this is intercession number four. Show me your glory. Moses isn't content to rest on his laurels just because he's got God to agree to go with the people. He genuinely wants to know God. He asks to see the glory of the Lord straight on. This isn't a contradiction with statements that say that Moses met with the Lord face to face, literally mouth to mouth in the Hebrew. In those instances, he saw God in a theophany, or just a, like a visible manifestation of God. Here, he's asking for something else. He's asking to see the full splendor of the Lord on display. As one commentator puts it, the Lord teases Moses. It's not possible to have anything more than a partial view, because even Moses cannot look on the face of the Lord and live. Instead, the Lord indicates that his glory is bound up with his goodness, which is bound up with his name. The Lord will proclaim this name in Moses' presence. As one commentator helpfully notes, 
there is a here a progressive revelation of God's character. The meaning of the divine name is expanded to include, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Or, I am gracious to whom I am gracious, and I am merciful to whom I am merciful. So that divine freedom that was expressed in Yahweh's name in Exodus 3 is here bound up with grace and mercy and not judgment and wrath, which could have been a possibility. God's nature is to show compassion. And this is his way, the way Moses asks to know. On the one hand, it reflects the changed relationship between God and the people that God's display of his glory will only be for Moses and not for the people as a whole, as it was in Exodus 20. But where there it was to test the people in order to keep them from sinning, here Moses learns not further fear of the Lord, but rather that he is a gracious God, full of compassion. Exodus 34 is therefore suffused and framed by the graciousness of God's character. The Lord has promised to show up, now he's going to do so. And he's going to make a full disclosure of his character, which is bound up with his willingness to reinstitute the broken covenant. He tells Moses to cut new stone tablets and meet him at the top of the mountain. This, then, is the essential context for Exodus 34. It reveals a God who is not safe, but who is good. And I know that this portrait of God can make many of us uncomfortable. But if we're going to treat the biblical narrative with integrity, we have to take this portrait seriously, remembering that the biblical authors see God as utterly good. God's graciousness wins out, though he takes how people respond to him very seriously. We have to remember here that the scriptures are not so much about Israel's greatness as they are about God's faithfulness to Israel and his commitment to work out his purposes in the world through them in spite of their consistent failure to remain faithful to him. Exodus 34 is going to speak to this tension. So God is not cruel, arbitrary, or petty. He forgives even as he punishes the guilty. Moses cuts the new tablets as commanded and ascends the mountain again. And as Exodus 34 recounts it, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. This is actually one of the key texts of the Hebrew scriptures. As we've heard, it comes at a particular moment in the biblical story, and it describes how God behaves in that moment. This self-revelation of God's character is subsequently re-quoted, partially quoted, cross-referenced, and alluded to dozens of times in the biblical narrative. In fact, it's the most re-quoted verse in the whole Bible. There's at least two very interesting and interrelated biblical Bible studies here, and my temptation was to get too deep into them as I was preparing here. Um, one would trace how the scriptures continuously refer and appeal to God's character as it's articulated in Exodus 34, and one would systematically explore the meaning of each of the words God uses in reference to himself. With that being said, my focus here is not on either of those things. I want to ask, is the tension we feel between verses 6 and 7 as modern re readers a tension God himself feels? Is it a problem for the biblical authors? Many of us moderns have a problem with God's anger. We assume God's anger leads to judgment, and we're allergic to that. Then we read something like verse 7, and we're, as they say, triggered. God visits the sins of the parents on the children and their children? This doesn't sound like the God we hear about in verse 6. 
Is this a contradiction? A closer reading reveals that, in fact, God is not vindictive. He is, however, prepared to deal with people as they respond to him. When God says that he will punish children to the third and the fourth generation, he's not saying he's going to punish you for your grandfather's sin. What he is saying is that he will contend with each generation on their own terms as they repeat or follow in the sins of their ancestors. Your grandfather's sin might make you more likely to pattern your own behavior after his. You might even live with the consequences of his sin, even if you're not being punished for it. But God deals with each generation and each person according to the choices that they make. The biblical narrative itself draws this out. In Numbers 14, as we're going to hear about in a few weeks, the rebellion of the people leads God to deny the generation that left Egypt his rest in the promised land. But he doesn't deny the children of that generation their future in the land. Later, when the people are sitting in exile in Babylon, they become fond of saying that the parents eat the sour grapes, but the children's mouths pucker at the taste. They believe the children are being punished for the sins of the parents. And God actually says this isn't the case. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. Indeed, if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is right and just, they will live. And this actually leads the Lord to challenge Israel, and I think this is a challenge that he's extending to us too. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? And to go beyond this even, Lamentations, which is reflecting on the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of the people, reminds us that hope for restoration extends beyond judgment. No one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. Another thing I wanted to highlight is that Exodus 34, 6-7 doesn't say that God is angry. It says that he's slow to anger. It's not in his nature to act rashly. He gives people lots of chances to repent. To make different choices. Even Pharaoh got ten chances to do things differently. So when God gets angry, it's always for a reason. It's measured, it's strategic, and it's constrained by his mercy and his grace. So what is it that makes God angry? It's actually the human propensity for evil. As one biblical scholar puts it, it's actually good news that an all-powerful and sovereign God cares about his creation enough to get angry about evil doing and take action. Because this gives us hope that justice will be done. The fact that God gets angry and holds people accountable doesn't bring his character into question. If anything, it actually witnesses to the goodness of that character. The last thing I wanted to point out is that in the whole of this statement in Exodus 34 and 6 and 7, the emphasis is on the first verse. God doesn't put aside his justice, but the scales are tipped towards mercy. Verse 7 ultimately isn't a contradiction of verse 6. It's a sad necessity, which even then is conditioned by the attributes that come before it. Throughout the scriptures, an appeal from a righteous intercessor or the repentance of the people sways God. His disposition is a merciful one. As one commentator points out, Moses' question in Exodus 34, or sorry, 32, as to whether God is willing to forgive the people is answered in Exodus 34. Though many English translations have it here as God forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, the Hebrew verb used here, nasah, is better translated carry or bear. And so God's willingness to carry the people's wrongdoing 
becomes the basis for a renewed relationship. As I was reflecting on this, it didn't sound very much like Dawkins's capriciously malevolent bully. And this leads me into my third point. God's character is consistent and trustworthy. I cannot stress enough how radical this portrait of the God of biblical faith is, especially when the Lord is compared to the gods of Israel's neighbors. In their worldview, the worldview of the neighbors, humans are afterthoughts, slaves of the gods. Their gods can't be expected to be faithful. And they're fickle and cruel. They're hard to please, and they're easy to offend. You never know which god might be mad at you, or whether your attempts to discern and satisfy their needs will work. The goal is simply staying out of trouble and hoping to get some benefit in the process. The worship of the gods is marked by anxiety and fear. And this, in part, is why God is so often described as a jealous God. It's not only because he is jealous of his right to be worshipped alone. It's because he's against false gods. Gods who can only do harm to those who follow them. As one Bible scholar puts it, worthless idols cannot bless or love or rescue. One wonders if God's jealousy is not still good news today. Israel, therefore, heard a profound statement of God's goodness in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, but also a profound statement about the stability of God's character, which they could have confidence in. God's character is consistent. The prophet Joel knows this. In a time of drought, famine, and locusts, brought on by God withdrawing his blessing due to Israel's violation of the covenant, he calls on Israel to rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Israel might be experiencing God's refusal to leave the guilty unpunished, but if they turn to God in humility, they can count on God to respond in a certain way because of his character. This is part of a pattern in Israel's story. The people find themselves in trouble, they cry out and turn to God, and he acts in a certain way, because this is what he's like. In fact, God's character is so dependable that it makes the prophet Jonah angry. <laughs> Nineveh was one of the big bad guys in the ancient world. But when they respond to God's warning of destruction and repentance, uh, God relents. As Jonah 4.2 says, To Jonah this seemed very wrong. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now putting aside the irony of Jonah, who has received God's grace and compassion, uh, responding in this way, it is clear God will respond to anyone who turns to him in mercy, even those outside of Israel. As Micah puts it, God delights in mercy. Now the Old Testament ends in an open-ended way. It's suffused with a profound hope that actually points beyond itself and which awaits resolution. If Israel is to be restored and God's purposes to restore, his, uh, to restore and bless his creation are to be realized, God himself is going to have to act. And in the Gospel of John, that is precisely what John says is happening. Jesus is the incarnation of the God we meet in Exodus 34. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, full of grace and truth reflects the Greek translation of two of the attributes associated with God in Exodus 34, hesed and emet, love and faithfulness. When these two words occur together, 
They are vouching for the reliability of God's love. God's character is not only consistent, it is trustworthy. And nothing demonstrates this more than the fact that God became man and walked among us, and ultimately bore our sins in his body on the cross, just as God carried the sin of the people at Sinai. This is how God removes our transgressions from us, as far as the east is from the west, in the words of Psalm 103. So, who is God? He's the God whose character is disclosed in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, who is fully revealed in the person of Jesus. How are we to respond? With Moses in worship. We, too, must have the courage to turn in humility to this God, to repent of our ways in favor of his way. For his way is the way of life. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, I invite you to consider where you need to turn to him. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord and receive his life. As Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. response uh, now to the proclamation of the word as we stand together and say the Nicene Creed. Let us confess our faith as we say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate with the Virgin Spirit, Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we offer our prayers to God. Eternal God, you have rescued us from condemnation and useless lives. This you have done by the precious blood of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who was and is the spotless and innocent Lamb. You have revealed yourself to us. Although, as Mr. Beaver and Simon state, you are not a tame lion, it is a privilege to know and serve the creator of the ends of the earth. 
our faith and hope is in you alone. We thank you that we can participate in this worship service, either in person or on Facebook. Continue to use this time of worship to separate us from the pressure of our daily lives and revive our commitment to be renewed by the transforming of our minds that we might know your will. Encourage and admonish all people who worship you today here in Kingston and around the world. We pray, O oh Lord, for this world. We all need your help. Some of us realize it and others do not. Heal and sustain those who are sick. Protect the elderly and those suffering from a chronic disease. We pray also for those who are young and strong and those who are unafraid. Cause them to understand that they too are vulnerable and must be careful and that you are the source of true strength. We pray for Donald and Melania Trump. Restore them to good health. Imbue in all of us an understanding of our own fragility and the importance of respecting guidelines established by health authorities. Reduce the amplitude of the second COVID wave sweeping Canada, the world, and Kingston. Guide and motivate scientists struggling to understand and control COVID. Encourage politicians to listen and respect scientists. We pray for your church in India, Brazil, Mexico, and other countries hard hit by COVID, that it will be a strong witness to your grace during this parlous time. Minister to Christians everywhere who are cut off from fellowship with other believers. Comfort and encourage people who are alone. We thank you that all of us have enough to eat and a warm place to sleep. And pray for the urban poor, especially those in Kingston. Protect them and show them mercy. Help them to get the help they need. Bless those who work to meet their needs. Instill in us the tendency to consider the needs and interests of others as more important than our own. Help us as a parish to believe that Jesus Christ came to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. We pray for children everywhere in the world who are forced to work for little or no money, break the cycle of poverty and debt in poor countries, Help us to be sensitive to their needs. The problems are overwhelming. Help us to both do our part and to trust you. Ease the tension on the Armenian border and the tension between Greece and Turkey. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, but it does not always feel that way. We know that we are too focused on what we consider to be our needs. We think too much about ourselves and not enough about others. Instill in us the conviction that all women and men are valuable and help us to love and serve the people we deal with and live with. Lord of heaven and earth, help us to purposely make you the Lord of our lives and to acknowledge and appreciate that you know what is best for us. Remove the scales from our eyes. Continually rekindle in our hearts a burning desire for you. Teach us to value the privilege of being able to get out of bed and serve you. We offer ourselves, our hearts, and our lives as a living sacrifice to you use our lives to bring you glory. Go with us into this new week, helping us 
to seek you and recognize you. Keep us anchored in your word and accountable to you. Fill us with your spirit and make us dependent on you. Make us eager to give everything for you and willing to move out of our comfort zone to do what you want us to do. And remind us that we are called to live out the life of a transformed and renewed people. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God, first in the silence of our own hearts, and then sharing in the confession together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Would you please stand as able? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all 
that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Thank you. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. And thanks be to God. Please be seated. So for communion, um, the communion has been prepared in such a way, as I said last week, that uh, um, has respected uh, all of the guidelines put forth by the diocese and our health unit. Uh, if you wish to receive communion, if you're here in the building, I just ask that you stand at your seat and hold out your hand, and I will place uh, a wafer that already has uh, wine on it. I'll place that in your hand uh, using tongs. 
If you're unable to stand but you would like communion, just make sure your hands are raised and I will know that. If you do not wish to partake in communion, uh, I will say a prayer of blessing. Uh, if you're watching us at home or if you're here in the building and do not wish to take communion, I'm going to lead you in a few minutes in this prayer for spiritual communion. And, and uh, uh, the point of this prayer is saying, Lord, even though I cannot participate physically in communion, I wish to possess you spiritually, uh, and I pray this prayer. And so I'm going to pray this now, and so if you're here in the building and uh, you do not wish to have communion, you're welcome to pray it out loud with me. If you're at home, uh, please pray it as well. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and as I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every altar of your church. And I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you, for I pray in your holy name. Gail is going to come forward now with hand sanitizer. Uh, for anyone who does wish to uh, take communion, you're welcome to stand now, and, uh, and Gail will uh, bring hand sanitizer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. taking eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Grace see the body and blood of Christ broken for you. The body and blood of Christ, the bread of heaven, keep you in eternal life.
let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. We proceeded for the announcements. Uh, just a few things. Uh, collection plates. We're not passing the collection plate uh, during the service, we don't have an offertory. Uh, if you uh, do uh, would like to give your tithes and offerings today, the collection plates are just at the back of the church, and I encourage you to use those. Uh, you're also able, of course, to continue with PAG uh, e-transfer. And <coughs> did I miss one? Canada helps. Canada helps. Canada helps as well. If you have any questions about any of that, John Telgeman, our treasurer, is the person uh, for you to speak to. You will be getting an email uh, from me the first of the week on behalf of our missions committee. Our missions committee uh, partners, as you know, with the Kingston Pregnancy Crisis Center. And one of the things that they do each year, their major fundraiser for the year, is they hand out baby bottles on Mother's Day. And they ask uh, churches to hand those out to their members to fill those baby bottles with loonies, toonies, coins, dollar bills, checks and then bring them all back on Father's Day, and all that money is used for the various programs that the King Kingston Pregnancy Center, or Crisis Pe Pregnancy Center offers. Of course, with COVID, they weren't able to, to hand out those bottles, so they're doing a, a virtual online baby bottle campaign. And so I will be sending you an email uh, the first of the week with that information uh, and the link if, uh, if you would like to give or feel, feel called to give how you can do that. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you could speak to Kyle Jowdry, who is on our missions committee, or indeed any one of our missions committee members, Ross, John, uh, Pauline is not here, uh, but I think those three people should be able uh, to help you. So expect that in your inbox the first of the week. Our Daily Bread devotionals uh, for September, October, November are at the back of the church on the, the table with the offering plates. If you're in the habit of using our daily bread, or if you're not, I encourage you to, to take one of those uh, before you leave. Uh, talking about leaving, when you leave, we ask that you respect social distancing as much as possible, uh, that you take the exit door in the back corner, unless steps are difficult for you, in which case, just go out the exact way you came. Uh, if you'd like to socialize or have fellowship with each other, we encourage that in the parking lot. Uh, not here in the building, but in the parking lot. And again, respecting social distancing and masking as, as all of you are comfortable. And once you leave the door, uh, you can do as you will. <laughs> um, so we pray that you have a good week this week. Uh, that you look for opportunities, um, as Simon encouraged us in, in his sermon, just to reflect on the nature of uh, and the character of God, on his goodness, and how that goodness has been manifested uh, in your life as we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving uh, next Sunday and, uh, and to be intentional about our thankfulness to God. Let us pray. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you, with those whom you love and serve, this day and always. Amen. Our closing song this morning is O oh, Praise the Name. Would you please stand? Would you cast my mind to cast
We will proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.